Hello, good afternoon, good morning and welcome to our weekly show Data Matters brought to you by Privacy Culture. My name's Steve Wright and I'm going to be the host for this session today. Normally it's my business partner Vicky Gilwar, but she's actually on the other side of the table this week. I'm interviewing her and we have a special guest to join her this week. We have Debbie Evans who's the Data Protection Officer for rent kill Initial. And Debbie's had uh, a fantastic career working for the likes of uh, Virgin Media, um, Clear Swift, all these fantastic organizations. So we've got some really great experience from a DPO perspective. And it's quite ironic because this conversation, Debbie only came on board on Monday when we were having a fantastic conversation, she was telling me all about the great initiatives that she's doing across her business, um, but more on that in a moment. So, uh, welcome to uh, Debbie. Hello, Debbie, give us a wave. Hi there, hello. Fantastic. And my wonderful business partner, Vicky. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Fantastic. So this week we are talking about the much anticipated drum roll. Uh, we are talking about training, awareness, communication and culture. This is a subject that's dear to our hearts, which is why we are called Privacy Culture. We believe that you have to embed a culture of privacy. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So without further ado, I'm going to fire off with the first question. Now, uh, the format, as you know, is we ask several questions, but really what we would like to do is hear from you with your questions. So please keep them coming. Ask some really, really hard questions for Vicky in particular. Uh, be Thank nice to you. do it. <laughs> and let's have a bit of fun. <laughs> OK, so the first question, um, we're going to talk for about 20, 30 minutes and uh, we get a feel for, for, for the, 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 uh, the whole subject. But uh, this first question is sort of with, and, and this is to you, Debbie, um, where, you know, in the articles or, or what is the minimum legal requirement for uh, training under GDPR or the Data Protection Act? Where, where, where do, what's the genesis for, the, for us even doing anything about training and awareness for our, for our employees? Right, thanks, Steve, for, um, for the opening. Um, so, I can go back before GDPR. Um, I mean, training of things like privacy is something that companies should have been doing as a matter of course. Um, however, what has happened as a result of GDPR and the Data Protection Act, um, it's now been given a, an even firmer footing, although arguably it was there in the first place uh, prior to GDPR, uh, because there's a requirement for data protection officers um, to include uh, training staff as part of their business um, process and operations, which you can see specifically in Article 71 of the Data Protection Act. And obviously you can see um, a hint of that in Article uh, 39 of GDPR. Um, and if you go before all of the, 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 you know, the current legislation, there was a requirement anyway for organisations to put the appropriate um, technical um, controls in yeah. place, operational controls in place. So there is a foot in for it already. But. OK, thank you. Um, and Vicky, I mean, you know, the, you do this for a living. <laughs> so what, what are the problems that you see typically when you're engaging with clients, with customers? Well, I think if we look at the concept of awareness, um, education as well and training to begin with, I think if anyone grappling with this topic and grappling to actually convince um, leadership or the organisation that it needs to be done only needs to look at the current situation we're in right now. You know, are people aware of COVID-19? Yes, they are. Do they understand their responsibilities? Is questionable. Um, I think for years, people that have been part of security, CISOs have probably answered the question, you know, are your staff trained? Yes, they are. Do they understand their responsibilities? Well, we run awareness campaigns on a regular basis. Do you actually measure that though? Well, we run phishing tests generally. Okay. Now we're in a situation, as Debbie mentioned, where we have to go much, much deeper into the organisation. We really have to get into the heart of it 
understand our audiences, really communicate with them in the right way as well. Um, previously, it was okay, you know, we're running an annual e learning training, we've, we've got a tick in the box, we've got compliance, we're chopping that up with awareness campaigns, that should be absolutely fine. But what about if you're on the shop floor and you receive a customer rights request? What happens when someone comes into the store? Are those people aware of what they need to do? So there has to be a, you know, a comprehensive plan in place. And I think that it, it probably took a while for businesses to understand that that's what they needed to do. They probably put training and awareness in one bucket to say, OK, we need to educate people on on GDPR. But did they actually think about we need to make senior leaders aware, data owners aware of their responsibilities under accountability? And we actually have to move that awareness right through the organisation and make sure that we have comprehensive and detailed training plans uh, and ways to measure that. At the same time as well, businesses have needed to look at their processes. It's OK, right, we need people to understand that they have to report a data breach. OK, there's a security incident process in place. Ah, but does it really help people to identify what, what is a breach? Um, is it timely enough? Are they actually speaking up? So I think all these different questions have, have arisen whilst people have been looking at GDPR holistically and looking at other controls as well. And there is a recognition that, that it's a big piece of ongoing work. And of course, that can be problematic for organisations. Thank you, um, Vicky. The, as as ever, super comprehensive answer. So, you, and you, and in fact, you answered a lot of my next question, which is perfect. But um, so, I'm I'm just going to ask Debbie. Just just Debbie. Um, you know, you've been a DPO for a number of years, and um, so you've seen from the early outset prior to GDPR coming in. You know, you would have worked with privacy principles and, uh, and and those sorts of things. Have you noticed a difference with the introduction of GDPR to, you know, to individuals, to consumers, customers? Is uh, Has it made any difference, do you think? And, you know, that's, yeah, I'll leave that like that. Yeah, so, so um, I don't know, you've probably read the EU Commission report on this, um, which came out uh, last month. Um, and they seem to be fairly confident that the citizens' rights have been met as a result of GDPR and that there is an increased awareness now um, amongst, you know, the people in the EU that they have these um, extensive rights, which they kind of did have before, but obviously now they've been given a, a firmer foot in with the sort of risk of fines sitting over them. Um, so, so the EU Commission is obviously satisfied that people are made, have been made more aware of their rights. Um, I certainly have seen evidence that um, companies have had people exercise their rights more in terms of data subject requests, etc. So, so obviously that's had an impact on organisations, certainly in terms of trying to respond to them. Um, and I guess um, in terms of um, its effectiveness, um, I, I, I could kind of question that a little bit because um, I, I certainly know from individuals I've spoken to that sometimes they feel that their rights haven't been fully met, maybe when they've complained to the ICO, but that's, you know, another challenge that I think the ICO is currently facing anyway, because of the excess, the excessive demand that's been placed upon them. But I, I do believe that people feel they have more rights, and that's certainly um, a, a step in the right direction in terms of this, this whole, you know, movement towards uh, better privacy generally. Yeah, I've, and thank you, Debbie. We've got, we've got some excellent questions coming in um, from, from uh, uh, hello, Adam. Nice to see you join us. That's fantastic to see you. Uh, and Emma. Um, and, and it sort of plays into a little bit into, into what we're, we're talking about because, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire straight away with this question from Emma because what she's saying, and I think you touched on it, Vicky, was that with COVID, you know, is everything else on the back burner? Now, uh, you know, com you know, naturally, we're, we're companies are some companies are struggling to even survive. Um, so, you know, what tends to happen is is budgets get cut and people get made redundant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Are you seeing any of that, Vicky? Is that is that something that you know has the emphasis changed with with your current clients? 
Great, great point, Emma. And yes, good time to raise it, Steve. Um, the answer, frankly, yes. Um, yes, that is happening. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that, that we have to stop doing this. I think we just have to think about reframing it, um, harnessing the environment we're in to help raise awareness and, and to kind of jump on the back um, of the other initiatives that are running in the businesses. So I've noticed a lot of companies are placing a, a lot of emphasis on training their staff on how to work at home securely. Um, so there's an opportunity there to join forces with the security team and make sure that you, you get the privacy messages in there. Um, and also to, to continually engage um, with leadership um, and other areas of the business this time, just to remind them that whilst we are all working at home in this environment, um, there is a, a potential danger that personal information might be distributed and held in the wrong places. So we need to be particularly careful. Um, so so just, just galvanise their support in continuing to ensure that that training does happen. And I have found as well that, that people are really interested in virtual classrooms at this time because we're all at home, we're all feeling a bit lonely. And actually it's a good time to get people engaged in this. Um, and they're more likely to ask questions because they want the conversation. So that's why I'm saying. Debbie, do you wanna? So, so I, I would say that this has been quite a challenging time for, for most companies and, and within my network I'm very aware that a lot of people have been put on furlough uh, and a lot of people, you know, and I, I, I can't speak personally about stuff at the moment for obvious reasons, but, mm -hmm. you know, budgets have been cut, etc. However, I think that, that there's an opportunity where you are still in a position to, to raise awareness and to, to keep going to get more creative. And, I, and I'm going to quickly show my bear, sorry. Um, so, so I wasn't able to travel. I have a global role. And um, unfortunately, I was going to get together with all the um, local privacy officers that we have globally in Milan, of all places, in March, you know, and uh, unfortunately. No, no. I'm um, glad you changed that, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and bad timing, uh, but I didn't know that that was going to happen. So, um, and obviously, you know, people got very concerned about it and, you know, people are more concerned, obviously, for business, con you know, to keep the business going. And But at the same time, they're aware that additional data has got to be collected because of the, the health um, uh, records uh, reasons, etc. Because they're trying to make sure that yeah. people are safe to go into work, etc. So, so what I've done, I mean, this is a bit silly. I know it's it's is my rentical privacy bear. It has a little logo on the back as well. Privacy matters. Um, I've put together a couple of these, and they're they're flying around safely, you know, and they've got all the <laughs> sanitised. Um, so that they're they're flying around various countries now, so that uh, locally people can kind of keep the message going. And, and the plan is to make sure that these travel the world. So we've got about 82 now, 83 countries we're in. I don't know if it's they're going to we're going to get to that many countries in a year. But the plan is to keep you know awareness going. And and I recognise a lot of people aren't feeling you know the love at the moment about anything because it's a tough time out there. So this was a sort of light-hearted way of making sure that people you know got the message in. And we're trying to sort of do a little campaign around it as well, just to actually get to everybody in the company not just you know that the people who have to implement all the processes but the people at all levels because we have a range of of people working at our company so uh, yeah. fantastic and and the bear's name has actually got oh. an identity yeah it's privington sorry privington <laughs> he doesn't like <laughs> labor, he likes Nutella. it's brilliant it's brilliant <laughs> thank you debbie thank you for sharing that um we've got some more interesting questions coming through and uh, because this is a very thought-provoking subject and one which is dear to all of our hearts um so it, uh, leslie has kindly commented that the ico in the past has put training to be provided on, on data protection and privacy at least twice a year um, is that enough? Uh, I mean, she hasn't asked that question. I'm asking that. Is that, I mean, given where we're at, given the, you know, th there's lots of um, distractions and, to, you know, Vicky's point about working from home and the security side of it, but is that enough? I mean, it's open to either of you. Is twice a year enough? Do we need to be doing more than that? I, I think it depends on the organisation and the type of services that people are involved with and the types of roles that you've got as well. Um, if, if your role, so you know, I'm constantly training. I mean, my, I feel I'm always training and always trying to learn. I mean, there's, it's never ending. 
Uh, and I'd expect that to be the case, given that I'm trying to understand the rules all over the place. Um, I think for seven people in our business, um, you know, we have people who will do hygiene services, who will be, you know, putting out pest traps or whatever. They probably don't need to have as much rigorous training as somebody who's probably, you know, designing, um, you know, a database, for example. Yeah. So, so we, we, you know, we've got training uh, courses available for different types of people. And obviously there's an expectation that they'll do what well, well, they're assigned the ones that are appropriate to their job. Um, once or twice a year, you know what? I mean, I, I think what I wouldn't want to do is overload people and, and 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 make them then go blank with it and they just click little buttons on some sort of training course yeah, and just get through it. it. Um, I, I personally, and it's a shame we can't do it in the, in the current environment, I like to have real face-to-face -face workshops where I actually get people involved in activities because I yeah. find if you go through some sort of real exercise with them, they really get it and it becomes a bit more personal to them because I sort of tailor it to the functions. Um, at the moment, it's more challenging because it is online and it is kind of semi, you know, not real. So it is, yeah. it is harder to get them as engaged. So anything creative, I think, helps. Thank you. That, no, that's really good. And and uh, Vicky, uh, I've got a good question here from Tim, but I, I'm going to take liberty here, Tim. I hope you don't mind. But um, so his point was about being careful not to be training in silos, so sort of counterintuitive. But he does mention about the the well known system of data champions. Um, you know, getting employees. What's your you know, in that scenario, is that is that the best way? You know, to we've got to drive out this accountability. But what's what's your thoughts on that, Vicky? Absolutely, yeah. So I'll, I'll take the first the first point about should we be careful not to put training in a silo? Absolutely, um, because it, it it does connect to so many things. And and as Debbie said, there are so many opportunities to provide training for specific audiences. So at the moment, I've seen a lot of organisations um, running process improvement. So everyone at the moment is making sure that their data breach process is robust um, and the management process is robust. So there's a chance for some, some virtual classroom training there. Um, so if, if, it, if it's connected to any other process, for example, the project management life cycle, um, there's an opportunity there to, to cover any privacy risk assessment process too. Um, so it, the ongoing educational pieces that you do don't have to be um, standalone. And in terms of your network, absolutely, If especially if you've got a, quite a disparate um, global organisation, if there are ambassadors, um, and these could be people that are already security champions or people that have actually got an interest in, in, in data privacy um, and they, they work closely with it, if they're planted into functions um, around and across the organisation, they can be your eyes and ears in terms of any particular risks that are coming up or any particular opportunities um, that they see. So yes, absolutely. I think those are the right people because they can also tell you um, if the channels of communication are still effective if there are any new channels of communication that you might want to try to try and and land the messages and they'll really tell you how people are feeling about the topic they'll tell you if the process is broken um, because and this is something i see so very often is if you don't get into the heart of the business like that and ask those kinds of questions, these are the things you won't find out. So you might think, well, reporting is low. Um, we've actually run a test on our breach process post breach and found that there was a delay in the reporting. Um, and then it's discovered that the process is just so convoluted that, that people have stopped using it. If you've got people that are right there on the ground, they're the ones that are going to be telling you that. Um, so if that's at all possible, I'd really advocate for having on the ground ambassadors. No, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. That, um, very clear. And um, for those of you asking, yes, the dog is under my desk. That's what's <laughs> making me annoyed. <laughs> Apologies. Um, just to clarify that. And the other point was um, I biannually is every two years. Quite rightly so. I'm sorry I jumped in and said every year. But, um, I, you know, I think I mean, I'll ask my panel, but I think what we were agreeing was that it's regular training and awareness and communication. So uh, just to clarify that point. So Debbie, um, Claire is asking about um, the really tricky subject of measuring the effectiveness. How do you 
you know, how do you know when it's working? What's your thoughts on that? Right. So, so good question. Um, ideally, I think uh, you, you have to do it over a, a, an extended period of time and you, you would have a sort of standard sort of questionnaire survey, whatever you want to call it, that you could roll out to, you know, to all employees to understand and assess their, um, you know, understanding, sorry, of the, of the privacy rules. And then you would follow that up you know, the next year to see if the training has actually worked and then you would carry on and carry on and carry on. Um, the, the problem with that is you do need to have, you know, mandated uh, completion of these surveys to get a really good feel of whether something's worked. And, and a lot of people will ignore surveys, but if you can do that, that's that's a good, uh, good way of measuring it. And you've got, obviously got some facts and figures you can use there. Um, you can also see, I think, if you can see improvements in the way um, maybe things are raised, for example, breaches or incidents, yes, you might get a flurry because people understand it, but you know that's a good thing because at least they're understanding it, whereas yeah, before yeah. you might have heard nothing. And then again, over time, you know, you'd expect maybe breaches and incidents to, to d diminish as people understand how to mitigate them or, or to stop them happening in the first place. So I, th I think it depends what size your organisation is and, and, you know, whether it is easy to do a survey or whether you would, you know, want to see whether there's more action, you know, after um, training. I think it, it really does depend. I mean, personally, I, I would like to do uh, more surveys. Uh, the challenge is then, um, you know, you've got to bear in mind we've got a global organisation and so there are pockets of, you know, very, various pockets of understanding. So it is quite a difficult thing then to get a real grip on what's going on. But but I have run some and, I, and I've got a pretty good idea of where some of the challenges are. Thank you, Vicky. Have you, did you want to add to that? If not, I've got a lovely little question here for you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, this, this bit, measurement and maturity is 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 really sort of close to my heart because you know, we need to understand the effectiveness um, of what we're doing in order to ensure behaviour is where we want it to be and ultimately so is culture. Um, so sort of going back to that network of people, if if the organisation is a particular size and you are able to, to galvanise a network, then, then they are the people that will give you an indication of what's happening. Um, if you've got a change function or if you have that kind of knowledge, I find focus groups are fantastic for this kind of thing as okay. well. Yeah. Um, and that's something that you can do remotely as well, just picking people from functions and asking them questions um, and just going back to my point around, you know, is the process working? You also need to test at the point of disruption. Um, Debbie mentioned, you know, a, a sort of flurry of reporting of, of incidents and breaches post awareness on that topic. But you also need to test each time that a breach happens, or particularly if it's a significant breach, whether the reporting was early enough. If it wasn't reported early enough or it wasn't reported at all, then there's a, there's a failure there um, in the piece of awareness and training. There's always an opportunity as well um, in some e-learning trainings that if you're doing that on a, a mandatory basis, rather than just um, measuring the compliance, you can actually measure where people are falling down to. So that gives you an opportunity. Yeah. So if they're not getting questions right and that's repeated, there's an opportunity there to, to sort of drill in into a piece of awareness on that particular topic to, to help educate people um, on that subject. Um, also, I would look to the security teams. Security teams are, are getting a lot more mature and sophisticated in this area. Um, they're using data to look at things like data loss prevention. So there might be a chance there um, to, to gain some insights into, into behaviour. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that ties in with the comments and feedback that we're getting. So keep them coming. Thank you ever so much. Your questions are are brilliant today. So thank you, Claire. Um, she mentions about using phishing emails as, as, a, as a, a good measurement uh, of people's awareness. Uh, Tony, hi again, Tony, good to see you here again. Um, yeah, he's talking about the culture. And so I, I just want to pick up on that before we go to Emma's question here. Uh, culture, I, I, you know, we use this word and it's very difficult to change a culture of an organisation, you know, um, I've had the pleasure uh, of working in places like PwC and Deloitte and there's a very distinctive culture in there. What what do we, Vicky, I know this is a subject dear to your heart, so, so, so what, what are we trying to change here 
is it is it the culture and how do we do that what's the what buttons are we meant to be pressing okay so i think i think first of all in terms in terms of culture what what is a privacy culture what what is it that we expect and and i think we kind of go to what what, what does good look like there i think and and debbie i'm sure will have um her, her kind of nirvana view as well i think for me it's yes there are breaches but they're being reported quickly any damage is, is minimal um, there's an open and transparent environment employees um, are confident that if they have if they do handle personal data that there are processes in place for them to do so they think about doing that um, the privacy team are fully aware of any projects that are going on um, using personal data as from outside of the organization it's very clear about what the company are doing there's a, a complete culture of, of trust um, that the topic is continually on the table at the board level um, that message is always always there and so i think that's that's kind of how it feels to, to have a privacy culture um, people often talk about changing the culture for an organization but for me, to begin with, you just need to look at the behaviour to start with. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. How are people behaving now? Why are they behaving in the way that they're behaving now? Um, going back to my point about processes, because this is so often the thing. Processes are difficult. People um, are reluctant. Um, and it may be that there are certain segments of an organisation where priorities are driving people away from behaving um, in a privacy sensitive way. So it's actually looking at those pockets of that organization and seeing where you can help as well. So it may take some time in, in order to achieve this. Um, and I think from Tony's point of view, he mentioned, as with so many other areas of organizations, there's a tendency, tendency to expect staff to read policies. Well, I completely agree with you, Tony. Um, somebody said to me years ago, if you're kind of beating somebody over the head with the policy, you failed. Um, we have to make sure that we we have a comprehensive awareness, education and training program in place. Yes, that does link back to the policies because that's what we set out at the beginning. But people need to have a sense of what that actually means to the company mm -hmm. and to their responsibilities. They need to be living and, and breathing that um, without getting sort of lost in that that legal language, if you like. Thank you. <laughs> so, Debbie, um, Emma asked a very good question or made a, a bit of a good point. And, and I wanted to know whether you kind of agree or disagree with this. Um, she was referring to the fact that, you know, when when breaches are reported, you know, people can get be worried about the repercussions of that. Um, you know, somebody getting in trouble for for actually telling the DPO or, or the CISO about that. What what can we do? What, what, what What's your advice that we can do about, you know, that sort of cultural piece? What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that's quite a common concern uh, for most uh, employees. Um, it's certainly something I've come across um, with some of the, the privacy officers, champions that I've come across in, in all the various companies that I've I've come across. Uh, and, and I think the key thing is, and I think, you know, this is important around the cultural piece. The key thing is to, I suppose, ensure that people understand that there are certain values that need to be sort of instilled in, in the staff and, and, and throughout the business. And it is about being honest. It's been about being open about what we do and what the right thing is to do, you know, doing things the right way. Yeah. And yeah. If, we, if, if, if people are worried about reporting staff and we get found out, that's far worse than being open about it and having to sort of clean up a little bit. It's a bit, you know, I've got children, you know, if they don't tell me they've smashed something, I'll find out and then they're going to be in trouble. <laughs> but if they tell me front, I'm more likely to be more lenient. And I, and I think, you know, I'm not saying I go around telling the staff, look, you know, what would you do if, you know, if you know, you did it and I'll find out later. But I think that's, a, a, you know, it's an analogy that we can all perhaps relate to whether we've got kids, whether, we, you know, if we can remember what we were like as children, that it's better to be upfront initially than have to sort of, you know, apologize later and i know sometimes that doesn't always sit sit well with certain types of cultures uh, particularly cultures where you know they, I, 
and I hope nobody on the, the call takes offense by this, but you know, where you've got a culture of very aggressive sales, marketing people, they're just as push, 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 you know, we'll worry about it later. Well, okay, but if you worry about it later, but, you know, the whole attitude, that's that attitude is not going to sit well. These, you know, the people looking out and, and the regulators are not your parents. They're not going to be as forgiving, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, right now. So I, I couldn't help that analogy. I was just thinking about something my kid did earlier. But, you know, you just got to be very upfront. Um, that That's my view. And I think as, as a privacy officer, I've got to provide assurance and I suppose um, make, make my champions, make my local privacy officers recognise that's the right thing to do. They're not yes. going to get into trouble for it. Yes, it's a problem, but we can fix it. You know, better to find out about it and be honest about it than hide it and then get into more trouble. So I've got to keep instilling them that it's the right thing to do. And I know people are fearful about it because they're worried that they're going to get into so much trouble. But that's kind of my job is to make them feel it's not, the you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. And thank you for telling me. I'm not going to tell you off. Let's just try and fix it now. Yeah, that's thank you. Great, great, um, great response there to those questions. So I think um, our producer has closed the questions now. Um, so I, um, I'm just going to start to think, ask you uh, um, both, please, to think about you. Um, I'm going to come to you and ask for your top tips in a minute. Um, uh, the, before I do so, I, 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 I've got a sort of more fundamental question. Um, and this is coming from uh, myself, who's uh, advising many small and large businesses. How, you know, this really does get quite tricky to um, operationalize this. Uh, what's, what's your thoughts on how we can, you know, more efficiently, more effective operationalize, especially when we're in a situation where budgets are being a bit cut and, a, and a, a comment earlier that came through about the uh, apparent uh, redundancies, potential redundancies. Um, that was a question that we, if we've got time, we, we'll answer. But uh, what's your thoughts on that? Um, Vicky, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think people have found this quite difficult because of its comprehensive nature and because perhaps, um, you know, it, generally, it sits in legal. It's not an area that has had to focus on on this type of comprehensive awareness and education and training before in the past. Um, so don't do it alone. I think that's the thing. First and foremost, don't don't try and do it alone. I think people tend to think, oh wow, we've got this huge burden um, and the consequences from the regulator if we don't do this and we don't get this right are so significant. But actually. Or usually in the organisation, there are people that are used to communicating and they're used to communicating with different audiences. So get those people on your side because they will be able to tell you which channels are, are going to be the most effective and, and help you. There's usually There are usually people that are used to doing learning and development as well. Um, so they can guide you um, if you need to support with vendors, if you need support, for example, with implementation. And in some organisations, they have uh, change management functions. And these people are fantastic when it comes to identifying audiences, impact um, and the key things that you need to tell them. So find your network to help as a starting point. And, right. and secondly, you know, look at the priorities. First and foremost, we we all know that there are certain obligations under this regulation that mean that things need to be reported on time or resolved on time um, in the case of rights. Those processes need to be known and people need to be educated on those first and foremost. There, of course, there are a lot of other audience groups that need that are handling personal data that need education. But those are two key things that we simply can't get wrong. So look at the priorities, I would say. That is brilliant, because before you answer, Debbie, I, I, I'm just I'm going to be a little bit naughty um, and change the question slightly. You know, um, there must be a lot of we have a lot of hundreds of DPOs tune into this show and I'm pretty sure um, many of them are facing into the same dilemma, which is budgets cut or zero based budgeting or at least 25 percent off. So my question is sort of similar about that. How do you how do you still make this a priority or is it a priority? Does it slip? You know, can we sort of similar to what we were asking earlier? Can it slip to next year or is this 
so, so I, I think it's a, sorry. I think it's a bigger priority now, actually, because the world is now going more digital, right? So there's more data, more personal data being exchanged in different ways. Uh, less paper documents will be used. There's going to be more electronic stuff. Um, uh, funnily enough, it's something now that you know. I mean, I, it was on the radar anyway, but it's something that's still getting the attention. Yes, budgets have been cut. I'm not going to lie to you about that. It's been cut, but it's been cut for everybody, so it's not unique um, to our space. It's it's happening across the board in businesses. I would suggest, and yep. so that means I have to be a bit more creative um, and, and really sort of think out of the box in terms of how I can deliver this stuff for less. Um, which you know I'm, I'm comfortable to do, um, but obviously it does require you know um, you know getting the buy-in from all your privacy champions or all the you know other business stakeholders to ensure that you can you know raise awareness, uh, ensure the audience are targeted appro appropriately in terms of any communications you need to get out and in, in terms of any messaging. Wonderful. Thank you. I do. And so I'm, I'm going to sort of wrap things up now. Um, but uh, so Vicky, uh, do you want to give us your top tips? What 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 would you say when you put your arms around that DPO or those CISOs that you work with? What would be your top kind of tips, if you like? And, and the same question is coming to you. Yeah. Sure. I think I think first and foremost, don't try and do this alone. You're not alone. There are so many people in this space, people that have gone before, particularly in security. They can be your friends, you know, learn from what others are doing, both within and outside of your organisation. Just surround yourself with people that are in the same boat and, and work together um, to come up with a solution to this because because there is one and, and you will find it. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Debbie? Pearls of wisdom. Pearls of wisdom. Oh, <laughs> so sweet. Um, I, I would say, I mean, look, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for fun ways of doing stuff, and I'll show the little bear again, just yeah. just because I can't help myself. But I think you've got to really understand every business you you come across has different cultures, different values, etc. But you've got to tap in very early on into the you know to the values and try and mould your date create data protection values, which is something you know I, I've done for most of the places I've worked for, at least try to. And that's then helps drive the messaging, drives how you target the audience and how then the whole campaign will work, because there is a campaign. Uh, and I think there are enough people now in this privacy space that you can reach out to, as you said, Vicky, you know, there's there's lots of people out there who can support you on this if, you, if you're not sure how to do it. Um, and it's it's definitely an evolving space. And I think there's a lot of very creative people out there who have who are having to do a lot with a very little. So, you know, absolutely just just tap into the networks and, and I'm happy, you know, if people want to contact me, I'm happy to sort of um, give some tips and hints on, on what to do if they're stuck. Thank you so much. I knew this was going to be a really fun and, uh, you know, thank you, Vicky, for letting me handle the controls for a little bit. <laughs> I was a bit nervous. Um, I'm just going to deal with Adam's question about this um, and, and feel free, Deb, if, you, if you're finding the same um, kind of thing. It's come up over a few conversations I've had over the last couple of days about these, um, you know, DPOs being made redundant. And I, and I, and I wonder if it's uh, scaremongering for first and fourth, you know, foremost, because I I know an awful lot of DPOs and I don't know any that are being made redundant. If anything, they're being asked to do more with less. That I think is probably what's happening. There's a tightening of belts and therefore I was speaking to uh, a colleague of mine in Ireland, I won't say which bank it was, but he was saying he had plans to hire another six people and they've been shelved, right? So I'm not sure that is happening. And the other thing I just wanted to note is, you know, in terms of we haven't really talked about enforcement action because we ran out of time, but there was a very interesting recent case by the Belgium Dutch Prote uh, Protection uh, Authority that uh, fined uh, Prom Prominus, which is uh, like Vodafone in Belgium, uh, for 50,000 euros for a lack of appointment of a data protection officer. So this is the Belgium, right? And that interestingly was the fact that the individual had a potential conflict of interest because guess what? They were asking them to do compliance, yeah. asking them to do this, asking them to do that. So we're being pulled too thin and, 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 and well done. I applaud the Dutch. Uh, I mean, sorry for the company getting fined, but I think it's a good point to say, you know, we've got to stand independent as the data protection officers 
and you know obviously that does you know we're in you know tr tricky times we're in a crisis let's not uh, forget that but that you know there still needs still needs to be that independence so i hope that answers that earlier question adam that came up but um any thoughts debbie any closing comments thoughts um for today's show um, yeah, well, I'm not going to comment on that. That's all doom and gloom. But I think obviously yeah. some businesses are genuinely suffering. So that's that's more yeah. of a bigger issue. Um, but what I would say is everybody, you know, this is a fantastic space. You know, I, I love being in this space. And I think there's so much opportunity now to help shape uh, the way businesses behave and to actually help, you know, improve people's rights fundamentally, because that's what it's yeah. about. Um, and, you know, and don't be afraid to be a bit quirky and a bit creative. Um, I, 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 that's why I like it so much, because I can do all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and I think, you know, you will stand out, you know, and you don't have to necessarily, you know, be all grey and, and, and boring. You can do stuff that's a bit more fun. Um, but obviously, it's still a serious matter. So as long as you're doing things the right way, you're open and honest about it and professional, then, you know, I'm sure you'll get the messaging out and, and good luck, everybody, with it, because it's, it's a challenge, but it's fun. Thank you, Debbie. Um, Vicky, any any closing comments, thoughts? No, I think that was brilliant. I completely agree with what Debbie said there. You can be fun with this. You can be creative with this. And, you know, people understand this more than ever now um, because everyone was part of GDPR. It wasn't just about businesses. It was about individuals. So eventually that awareness that we have as individuals will start to work its way back into the business and drive risk down. And I think that's really, really important. Individuals will start to really help organisations on this topic in the end. So you can eventually tap into everyone to help you. So wonderful. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Debbie Evans, Group DPO of Rentico Initial and Victoria Gilwell, partner at Privacy Culture. Thank you both so much. It was wonderful. Uh, listen, uh, next week uh, is, is very close to the end of this series one. Um, we have a special guest for the very far, um, very last show on the 24th. And I'm looking forward to announcing that in the next week or so. But we have Sana from Harvey Nicks coming next week to talk to us about, guess what? Yes, Ropers, Records of Processing, that wonderful documentation which you can get lost in Excel uh, and have a wonderful time working out the lawful basis. So we have Sana coming to join us next week. I think Vicky will be back in the driving seat, so don't worry. Uh, be a bit of professionalism coming back to the show next week. But once again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please comment, please give us feedback. We love to learn. We want to tackle new subjects in the new series in, in September. So any ideas on a postcard, please. But it's Steve Wright uh, signing off from Data Matters. Thank you very much for listening.